listen by this word that it will not go out and return to him void, but it shall accomplish and that it shall prosper. So God guarantees his word. We then must ready ourselves to receive what thus saith the Lord. To not be disinterested nor distracted, but determined to hear what the Lord has to say to us today. Our preaching theme for the year is, but God. And it means that God is sovereign. That God has the first and the final word. Let us then look at the book of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment in time and opportunity that you have given us to again enter into your holy presence. We pray that we do so reverently and humbly, acknowledging that you are almighty, eternal God, our Father, creator of all. Thank you for this moment of your mercy and grace that you have allowed us to experience. Thank you for every good and every perfect gift that you have bestowed upon us. We confess and repent of our sin and ask now that you will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then when you speak to us, Lord, we will readily receive what you have prepared for us. Thank you, Lord. It is in your Son, our Savior, Christ Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. I want to preach the word of God today from this thought, church. The trials and sufferings are permitted with purpose. The trials and sufferings are permitted with purpose. Peter, Simon Barjona, Peter, the brother to Andrew, fisherman by trade and disciple, apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, writes in his letter, 1 Peter, and deals thematically with the reality of trials and suffering. Yeah. Is he talking to anybody here today? Right. Yeah. The reality of trials and suffering. Yeah. But the point that Peter wants to drive home in this book of First Peter is the fact that trials and suffering are permitted by God because God has a redemptive purpose for everything that he allows us to go through. Amen. Should have been a better amen in here than that. But I guess I'm going to have to preach. I thought I would just tell you what it said and that you would say amen and we'd be ready to go. But the fact that you weren't really on time, on schedule with your amen, now forces me to have to walk through the text. Walk with me today, church. Peter begins in the book of 1 Peter with greeting the believers who are scattered abroad. And we talked a little bit in Sunday school about the reality of persecution among the believers. But Peter does this back in chapter 1. He says, thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ, for we who are believers have an incorruptible inheritance. Now that means this, that we have something that God has given to us, God has prepared for us that is incorruptible. That just simply means that the world can't do it no harm. The thing that God has for us, that he's prepared for us, 
is an incorruptible inheritance and that we are kept by the power of God. Do you know that God keeps you today, church? <laughs> Peter says, now for a season, and this is important back in chapter 1, Peter uh, write that word down, for a season. That means it ain't going to be like that all the time. It's just a temporary thing that we're dealing with. For a season that we go through trials. Yet the trial of our faith, when it is tried, it results in producing gold. Gold that then points to the praise, honor, and glory unto God. So then when God allows us to go through trials, that the trial won't break us. The trial just helps to make us what God wants us to be. I'm almost there, church. He then talks about, here's another word, holiness amongst believers. Holiness and sanctification. To be obedient to God and his word. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that we may grow. That's another word you ought to highlight and take note of. God wants us to grow. Well, then how do we grow? There are times that God permits trials and suffering because he's trying to help us to grow, to get better than where we are, to get further than where we are. He goes on. Peter talks about that we who are the children of God of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We ain't like everybody else. So then when everybody else doing what they think they want to do, we ain't like that. Y'all in here with me today, and, and I do apologize for my bad grandma, but we ain't like that, church. We are a chosen generation called to do what the Lord has told us to do. Yeah. Peter goes on and then starts to talk about our conversation. And that word conversation isn't just what we talk about, but it points to our, here it is, lifestyle. Yeah. Underline that and make a note of that in your sermon notes today. Yeah. Our lifestyle, it reverts back to this whole notion of holiness and sanctification. When you're called of God and you're going to live for the Lord, you got to do things the way God says do things. Here's what Jesus said. When they cussing at you, you give them a good word. When they won't even give you a drink of water, you go ahead and help them. Jesus said that we as believers and followers of him Got to do the right thing and have the right kind of lifestyle. So now, it's not for us to be able to do what everybody else doing. As a, as a, as a, as a boy growing up, the worst thing that I ever tried to tell my mama was about what somebody else was doing in their house. Y'all know what she told me, don't you? She said, now look at here. You live in my house. And I pay the bill and I put the food on the table. You going to do what I tell you to do. No matter what your buddy down the street doing. I should have had some help in here. Church ought to be on fire right now. But the church ain't on fire if you let your children do everything they want to do. You want to be friends with them. The Bible calls you to be their parent and to raise them right. If they don't like it, that's on them. But don't expect me to play down to the situation. God told me to give you direction and be godly. Hey. 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 <laughs> This for free, y'all. This for free. You know, this, this is no charge for this. 
Yes, so when they get to an age, yes, sir. and they don't, they don't want to do what you tell them to do in that moment, yes, and they are broader than you <laughs> in your own house, <laughs> they know where the door is. <laughs> now somebody mad about that. They say, the pastor will put his put, put chair out. That's not what I said. Look, don't twist it. Get it right. Because it was for free. What I said was every day they walk out the door with a full stomach. Every day they walk out the door with clothes on their back. Every day that they have a chance to ride instead of walk. They go out that door every day. Well, now, if they can't do what I tell them to do, because I'm trying to do what the Lord told me to do, they know where the door is. And if they want to walk out the door, that's on them. I'll never cease to pray for my children. But they can't control me. They can't rule me just because they don't like the godly parenting I'm trying to give them. Peter goes on to talk about that it is important that we learn how to submit. Submission then points to God's order. And then Peter goes on to say that for Christ was our example in submitting because he submitted and showed his submission through his suffering. So then he tagged this. Peter tagged this. So then in our home relationships that we got to know the order of God. Even in our secular relationships. Peter talks about the importance of showing proper submission to those who are in authority. One more time. And this is for those who still in school coming along. It's not your job to go rule the classroom. You are not the teacher. You are not the principal, the dean. You are the student. Understand God's order. If something happens in school that you're concerned about, come back and let your parents know the whole story. Don't just give the part of the story that's going to try to make you look good. Listen, if you were talking and you were misbehaving and were doing what you weren't supposed to be doing, if you're going to come and tell, tell the whole story. So parents, make sure you get the whole story before you want to go trying to hurt somebody. Y'all ain't with me today, church. I'm almost there. Peter talks about the importance of submission and order. He then talks about conduct in the church among believers. Because while he dealt with home and secular, he don't want to leave the church out. Y'all want to know what Peter says about the church? In chapter number 4, verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin. Where? In the house of God. Is that in your Bible? Peter says, just because you come to church and just because you say you're a child of God, don't think that that gives you some brownie point with God. Because if God told you not to do it, don't do it. If God told you to do it, put your hand to do what God has called you today. God is going to come through the house. The house of God. So we don't get a pass. Yes, sir. Now some folks think that simply because they advocate that the Ten Commandments be hung uh-huh. somewhere on a wall. Yes, that, that means that they are tight and right with God. 
the Ten Commandments. Yes, sir. If you are not living it from your heart, and let me just go on the record. I, I don't know if it was a noble beginning or what, but I am somewhat today when I look at the how the secular world has taken what is for us sacred and holy and, and tried to manipulate it. What am I talking about? I'm talking about that somebody put their hand on a body and say that they're going to do what the book said do. As they discharge their office in the secular realm. And then no sooner than they take their hand off the Bible, they begin to do everything that the Bible says a man of not do. I believe, I'm talking about me now, church. I believe that if you don't take office, just hold your hand up and say what you're going to do, but leave the word of God out of the equation. Why? Because if you're not prepared to stand on the word of God, don't play with God's word like that, church. So don't play with God's word like that. Man say he's going to uphold the law. And the law says the sitting president gets to make a nomination to the Supreme Court. But a man who put his hand on the Bible says, no, the law ain't, ain't right in this case. Because I don't like the politics of the person who's going to be making the choice. So I will unilaterally decide not to follow the Constitution of the United States of America, and I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. How do you put your hand on a Bible and then stand and do that which is opposite because the Word has told us that God has told us to respect authority. And yet here you are abusing authority and say just because you decide to go to church one day. Not, not on a regular basis. And so I invite them to come and have church with us so that they'll get a true word from God. Not that nobody else preaches the true word of God, but in too many places there are those that God has given a charge to stand and declare what thus saith the Lord who are stepping back from proclaiming God's word because they are impressed by the person who comes through the door. Listen, one day, no matter who he is, no matter what title he or she has, they're going to lay down and die and have to stand before God. You got to tell them the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Judgment. Peter said the house of God got some things that God is going to have to straighten us up with. He then, in chapter 5, and someone was wondering, when are you going to get there? I'm there, y'all. Chapter 5, he begins and tells the elders that they ought to be witnesses of the suffering Elders who are leaders understand how Christ suffered and that as he suffered and we identify with him that we can be partakers of the glory that shall be revealed. He tells the leader, here it is, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof not by constraint but willingly. Here it is, not for 50 lucre, but of a ready mind. That means a preacher can't be a money grubber. I thought y'all would have shouted off of that. The Bible says the preacher can't be all the time trying to get, 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 get. 
Got the anniversary in January. Got the anniversary in February. Got the anniversary in March. Got the anniversary in April. Got the anniversary in May. Got the anniversary in June. Got the anniversary in July. August, September, October, November, and December. It's birthday time, huh? Not greedy for filthy lucre, but a ready man. Here it is. Neither being lords over God's inheritance. We all belong to the Lord, church. Can I say that again? We all belong to the Lord. But to the leader, he said this. Be an example to the flock. That, that puts a responsibility on the leader. So now, when everybody else having a bad day, and when everybody else saying stuff they ought not be saying, and when everybody else is having trouble, the Bible says, as the leader, God says, you have to be an example. So that when they don't talk right to you, you got to smile and love them right on. Are you, are you in the house with me today? And it's quiet because somebody knows you can remember that day you ain't talked to pastor the, the way you should have talked to pastor. But it's all right. God said that I have to be the example. So there are things, being the example, there are things, <laughs> I got to take it and take it to the Lord. Y'all hear with me? I got to take it to the Lord. God did not give me any authority to whip any of his children. He is the father. Any whipping to be done, God will do it. Inclusive of, watch this now, y'all ain't supposed to be whipping me now the same way I'm not to whip you. Don't think that gives you the okay to be whipping on God's men. No, the Bible says you ought to give the respect to the task that God has called them to do. And if there's a disagreement, the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit in me ought to figure out a way to get it right. Are y'all going to walk with me today? On my way home, church. Humble yourself. That's another good word. Humble yourself. Under the mighty hand of God. That he may exalt you or lift you up from where you are. When? In due time. Our folk parent put it this way. You can't hurry, God. No, no, you just got to wait. Got to trust God and give him time. No matter how long it takes. He's a God you cannot hurry. Anybody know he'll be there? Don't you worry. And you can cast all your care upon him. For he cares for you. Highlight that in your Bible. God cares for you. He then closes out and says, Be sober. Act with some sense, y'all. Be vigilant because you have an adversary. Who is your adversary? Who is your enemy? The devil. And a roaring lion. And you know the lion roars before he gets there. Won't you know he's on his way? So that you start to get nervous even before he gets there. He walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So now his intent is to cause harm. His intent is to hurt. He's like wily coyote towards the road run. He's like old Sylvester the cat towards Tweety, yeah. He's 
like Tom the cat towards Jerry. Somebody say he watched a lot of cartoons when he was growing up. The devil is after you. But the Lord said resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You ain't the only one that the devil trying to harm. You're not the only one the devil is trying to put a stumbling block in your path. But learn from those saints who have gotten strong in the Lord how to resist the devil. I owe an apology to our foreparents because those old ladies, when they were battling family situations, yes, children may not have been doing right. Mm -hmm. And they would talk to the Lord while they were out washing clothes. Mm -hmm. Not a washing machine, yes, sir. but a tin tub yes, and a rub board. Yes, and you had to put some strength on it. Yes, and then after you washed them, you had to hand wring them. Yes, sir. And then hang them on the line. And young people, it's graduation day, so let me throw this in for free. Before there were pampers, before there were loves, before there were, and you can name all the other brands, your mama had to take your diaper and wash that diaper on her hands. You are the Your mama for what she did for you. Stop trying to find all the fault and look at what was done. On your behalf. I'm on my way home. But I remember the first time. Because I'm older than my brothers. I remember the first time. Yes, sir. My mama gave me a diaper <laughs> and told me to. <laughs> go out there and wash. <laughs> go out there and wash. Go out there and wash your diaper. <laughs> the love of a mother. Y'all hear me in the big church? The love of our mothers who helped us to get to where we are now. Yes, sir. Hey. So we will always honor our mothers. Yes, sir. We'll always honor Sister German. Yes, sir. We'll always honor Sister Otty. Yes, we'll always honor Sister Ella. Yes, and all of the other aged women of this church yes, who made sacrifices that you and I have somewhere now that we can come and give God the praise. You ought to voluntarily give God a hand clap of praise for thee. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. And remember, Peter's already said the predicate. Christ suffered. Christ went through trials. Christ sacrificed mm -hmm. on our behalf. Amen. He set the example for us Amen. that we must now carry on. Amen. He says, now, after you have suffered a while, mm -hmm. again, for a season, mm -hmm. just a while, mm -hmm. are you all right with a while? Amen. Amen. Are you okay with a while? Amen. Are you okay with a while? Right. See, there, there's no specific time frame. Mm -hmm. Because somebody want to know, it's just going to be a day. Yes, sir. And if I make it through the end of the day, yes, sir. or a week, if I can just make it through the end of the week. Yes, sir. But what is a while? A while is however long God decides to let you go through the trial and the suffering. That's the while. 
But there is a redemptive purpose mm -hmm. for everything that you go through. Amen. All of your suffering, Amen. all of your trials, yes. all of your battling against the enemy. Mm -hmm. Says this, after you've suffered a while, God will make you perfect, yes, sir. establish, yes, sir. strengthen, yes, sir. and settle you. Amen. Amen. Let me take those four words all together. Life today can sometimes be unsettling. Life today can sometimes sap the energy from us. Life today can just sometimes be difficult. Trials that we did not make on our own. And yet we've got to deal with them. But the scripture says, after a while, God is perfecting you. God is maturing us. God is making us fit and sufficient. He establishes us. Or in other words, that we can bear the weight under pressure. So if you think of a foundation that holds up the structure of the building, Amen. that we'll be able to bear the weight. Mm -hmm. He will strengthen us as, again, weight that we may have to lift. But you know that the more you lift the weight, yes, the more you can lift the weight. Amen. The more you lift that weight, you're able to put more weight yes, on the bar. Mm -hmm. This is what God wants to do in us. He wants to strengthen us through the trials, through the suffering, through the struggle, and then settle us. Church, and this is it. We've got to get to a point where we don't let just everything bug us out. We have got to get a point, to a point. Where you are settled in the Lord. When stuff don't work out the way we think it ought to work out, I'm still going to trust the Lord. Why? Because I'm going to be settled. Be settled. I'm not going to fly off the hemp about everything that ain't going the way I think it ought to be going. Be settled. When you're settled in the Lord, God can talk to you in that quiet moment and reassure you that he's in control. Spouse ain't doing all right, be settled in the Lord. Children aren't doing all right, be settled in the Lord. Things on your job are doing right. Be settled in the Lord. He promised that as we go through the trials, the tests, the suffering, there's a redemptive purpose that God is walking us through it. Because in the end, when you come through, the world talks about what are the odds. And the odds are simply a statistical analysis of the likelihood of a particular outcome. Yes, sir. Even when the world says that the odds are against us because of who we belong to, the outcome is already guaranteed. We're going to win. I said, we're going to win, you know. You're not excited to know that we are winners today. When you know you are a winner, you don't care what the scoreboard says right now. But you play as hard when the scoreboard says you're losing because you know if you keep on keeping on, God has promised. Victory. Victory. Is guaranteed. 
no matter what they say in Vegas, what are the odds? Yes, sir. God says it's in his hand. Yes, and knowing that, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Get excited about that. Get excited about that, church. That God will perfect you. Establish you. Settle you. You ain't got to worry about everything that the world tries to throw at you. Because the day that the Lord called my name and I check out of here, y'all don't be sad. Come and rejoice. Then I gave God everything I had. Every time I came, I didn't hold anything back. And when you do that, whenever the Lord blow the whistle and say it's game over, it's time to go, you know. God's got it all in control. But you got to be settled in yourself. If you're here today, we bid you to come to Jesus. Amen.